Shakespeare is ready to reopen in Utah. It is the 60th anniversary for the Utah Shakespeare Festival. We go over the plays that you can see and the things you can do. Plus, the festival will remember its founder, Fred Adams, who we lost last year, a bittersweet remembrance. Hi, everyone, and cheers. Cheers. Well, we are going virtual with the Bard. The Utah Shakespeare Festival in Cedar City, Utah at Southern Utah State University is opening for its 60th anniversary. And we got the scoop by Zoom with executive producer Frank Mack about the upcoming season. Now, there are only mask restrictions for the indoor theaters. Outdoors, no masks needed. Still, you should check first. But that's not stopping Shakespeare fans. Frank tells us the preseason sales show that theater goers are heading back. Definitely. We're seeing marvelous ticket sales response. Um, so many people are eager to get back to doing the things they love during the summer. We have a wonderful, loyal crowd that loves to come here every summer and see the Shakespeare Festival. And we're at the same level of tickets we would be at in a normal season. So we've sold about $2 million in tickets already for a season that doesn't start for a couple of weeks yet. Um, and that's a great sign for us. It's kind of where we would be in a normal year, which is remarkable because this just isn't a normal year. Oh, absolutely. I was just going to say people are probably chomping at the bit to get out there. And as you said, that you have that great open air space, that great theater. And, you know, I remember we, we saw it. It was under construction for a little while and we saw it and it was so beautiful. And um, you provide really great entertainment for the whole family. So everybody really can come and enjoy everything. Totally. Yes. It's very family friendly environment. Um, sometimes, occasionally, we might do a contemporary play that might be a little on the adult side, but we'll put those warnings or we'll put those, um, uh, that information up on our website about all our plays. This year, I think all our plays are family friendly. I'm not hesitating much at all. I just want to process it uh, as I think through all of the shows. Of course, the Shakespeare plays, I consider them family friendly. As you know, Shakespeare wrote some pretty heavy-duty stuff. Richard III is a bad dude. <laughs> I mean, and children get killed in that play. But I would bring my kids to it because it's great classical storytelling. It's some of the best material in the world. And while Richard is an evil character, there's no question about it, uh, there is violence in that play. Um, I think Shakespeare is an excellent thing for young people to experience. Maybe not little tots, uh, you know, if, if they're still in diapers and stuff, uh, <laughs> they're too young for that. But, um, but I started taking my kids to Shakespeare plays kind of as soon as I thought they could follow the story, early, five, six, seven years old. Um, there's one of our plays called Intimate Apparel, which is in our studio theater which deals with sort of forbidden love. And um, while, again, I would feel comfortable with my kids seeing it, there's no, there's no explicit anything in it, no, no explicit sexuality or anything like that. Um, they're adult themes, um, and some people might not want to bring their kids to that. Mm -hmm. But the Pirates of Penzance... It's just a bunch of goofy pirates and, you know, <laughs> silly police officers and a major general who says he knows everything about the military, but actually kind of doesn't know much at all. Um, it's just <laughs> wonderful fun. Um, Ragtime is a beautiful story, quite serious subject matter. Again, immigrant stories uh, deals with race. Um, <clears throat> brilliant, magnificent music. It's based on a, a genius novel by E.L. Doctorow called Ragtime. Um, I think it's a great story, but generally it's a wonderful family friendly environment. And of course, I haven't even mentioned The Green Show, which is this free outdoor entertainment, singing, dancing, jokes, and that's just made to order for families. Certainly the, 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 the sad part of last year was that we lost Fred, Fred Adams. Yes. Um, and this year, 
you're going to be remembering him. I want you to talk about that because it's, it's certainly near and dear to Susan's and my heart about how much we loved him and how he was so good. Uh, not only he was so good to us, he was so great to me when I was a news anchor in, in Las Vegas. I mean, every year he would allow me to come up and do a half hour show with him. Uh, and we just had a great time. Talk about what you're going to do for Fred this year. And then, then, I, then I want to get into the rest of the shows. Sure, of course. Well, of course, your experience with Fred, both you and Susan, is just like so many people's experience with Fred. He was a remarkable human being, and he founded this Shakespeare theater in the most unlikely of places in Little Cedar City, Utah in 1962, and somehow he had a vision that we could have a world-class Tony Award-winning theater professionally producing three theaters of live performances and repertory all at once. Um, and it came true. He made it come true. He had tremendous will, vision, and love. And Fred was beloved by basically everyone he encountered. And we lost him in early February of 2020, and we miss him profoundly. But I'll tell you, I don't know if we could have made it through COVID and gotten it together to do what we needed to do to produce this season now if it weren't for the inspiration we drew from Fred. Because we knew what Fred would be saying. Fred would be saying, of course you can. You can do it. You must do it. And we heard his voice loud and clear, and it inspired all of us to do what he would have done which is to produce a great season of theater for all of our patrons. We've dedicated the season to him. So the, the whole season is dedicated to Fred and it's our 60th anniversary season. So he started this thing 60 years ago and it's a bit of poetic justice that at least we can dedicate the 60th season to his memory and celebrate his life all summer long. When we come back, Frank will go in depth on some of the plays. More ahead on the Utah Shakespeare Festival 2021. And welcome back to our look at the Utah Shakespeare Festival 2021. And we mentioned the passing of the founder, Fred Adams. Now, in, in my years of interviewing him, and I've told you about this a lot, he always had some reason whether it was something in the news or politics that led him to pick the plays for each season. So we asked Frank the same question about how this season's works were chosen. We do, of course, we do pick our seasons based on a theme and thematic ideas that we try to match dramatic material to uh, develop thematic ideas that can be realized across the different plays we do. Um, artistic director, Brian Vaughn, chooses the plays and he puts an enormous amount of thought into that. And I think for the 2021 season, a lot of what he was thinking about had to do with reconciliation. A lot of the plays deal with um, people reconciling difficult things in their lives um, and finding meaning and joy and celebration through that reconciliation. Run, th run through just a couple of, you mentioned Pericles. I, I, I think that ties into today's 23andMe and Ancestry.com. <laughs> How do you see that? I'm curious about. Well, he, about he, he had a child and all of a sudden at the end, he finds out who his kid is. Right. Yes. Yes. I get it. Okay. Thank you. Kind of yeah, typical Shakespeare. So, yes. Yes. Um, that's that, and you're you're right. Yes, that's a great that's a great little insight into Pericles. It's an it's this adventure story. It's kind of people sometimes call it Shakespeare's Odyssey. He he's all over the map. He's going to these exotic places in the Mediterranean, which in Shakespeare's world would have might as well have been Mars. You know, I mean, it was these far flung exotic places, and yeah, all that crazy stuff happens to him including realizing um, his own family is his family. So it's, yes, it's, it's a wonderful, exciting. And I think the experience of the story is mostly focused on all that adventure, solving riddles. And there's not just one shipwreck, there's two. 
you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's awesome fun. And it's actually, I'm surprised it's not a more popular Shakespeare play because it's so fun to watch. And of course, um, his genius is all over the place in all of his plays and there's beautiful poetic language throughout it. So I, I'm sure you'll enjoy it and you'll especially enjoy the, the DNA discoveries that <laughs> might be hidden from some of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, and speaking of fun, I, I saw that you also have the one called Comedy of Terrors, which yes. that, that does sound so silly and fun to me. That's, you're exactly right. It is silly and meant to be. Um, this is a contemporary play based ever so loosely on comedy of errors, but it's this idea of mistaken identity, which is also a theme that we'll see in lots of our plays. Um, and these authors just take the, so Shakespeare based comedy of errors on some source material, a play called the Menachme, uh, a, a Roman, an ancient Roman play that had mistaken identity that involved twins. And then Shakespeare added another set of twins just to make it even more fun. And in Comedy of Terrors, they had two actors, two sets of twins, and then some triplets, all performed by just two actors. And so it's just massive fun, silly, delightful, charming, and um, really just a blast, especially to see as a companion piece with Comedy of Errors. And that must be really fun for the actors to play too. Yeah, it's a married couple. Um, they're wonderful actors. Um, they're, they're festival favorites. A lot of our audience are familiar uh, with Michael Doherty who, and, and Alex Kuyper, his wife. Um, they'll be doing the play together and they're marvelously funny actors. And it's, it is fun for them to perform um, and equally fun for the audience to watch. All right, let, me, let, let me go maybe a little bit dark here, but uh, you mentioned Richard III. It, it, does that scream Trump? That's in the eye of the beholder. Um, so well put. Us, <laughs> we're, we're, not, we're not thinking about that. We're producing a history play. We want to produce the whole history cycle. We're doing, we've got this project to complete the canon and do all of Shakespeare plays. And this is part of a series. We did Henry the Six, parts one, two, and three. Richard the Third is next. Um, Shakespeare... I mentioned that his genius is all over his plays. What, whatever people sort of read into it, there's no denying that it is, you can't take your eyes off Richard. He is this magnetic character. He is as evil as evil gets. I mean, his, and that's the beauty of Shakespeare. When Shakespeare is writing a character with ill intentions, we don't just get sort of a bad guy or a comic supervillain or something, we get Iago in Othello. And Iago, you just can't believe the depths that that guy will go to to get what he wants. And Richard is like that as well. But what's so irresistible about Shakespeare's characters like this is you understand why he's doing what he's doing. And he's doing some awful stuff. I mean, we're talking violence, murder, just uh, scheming to a degree that most of us could never even conceptualize. And the genius of Shakespeare is you, you, you understand it. And so it's not just, he's not just this sort of mustache twirling villain. It, it's a little disturbing that you're like, oh, I, I get why he's doing that. I can't believe he's doing it, but we can, uh, we can identify him because he, Shakespeare draws characters with real dimension and real humanity, even when they're doing things that are just awful, terrible things. It's a magnificent play. For a lot of Shakespeare enthusiasts, it's one of their favorite plays um, because Richard is just such a compelling figure. Oh, if we could all be Falstaffs. I mean, if yeah, we right. That, you know? Um, <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about one other. Um, I saw the original Ragtime uh, back in the late nineteen oh, nineties on Broadway, and it was it was brilliant. And yes. I noticed after nine eleven, because of the bombings, Ragtime went away. This is the first time I've seen Ragtime back. 
was there was there a little bit of a problem with with that because of the because there is some bombings that that go on in in yeah time. uh was was that something is is there a reason why we we it's been almost like 20 years since we've really seen this great play i haven't heard that but it, it's possible and i don't know why there hasn't been a broadway revival you know sort of more recently but that wasn't really a factor for us. We're interested in that story, an immigrant story, a story of people from different walks of lives whose lives become intertwined and start to discover their common humanity. And that's, that's really what's interesting for us right now. Although, again, people will see different things when they see it. And there's, you know, there's a lot going on. This is a vast, vast story. Um, an American story like, you know, no other. I mean, it's, it's a truly American piece. And the score is magnificent. The characters are so fascinating. Um, and you can, you can see those socio-political aspects to it in different ways. For us, we wanted to tell the story of um, how immigrant families come and experience and achieve their American dreams and sort of the complexity and the, uh, and the richness of that particular story is very appealing uh, dramatically for us. Well, and as you mentioned, I think it's so interesting that from when it was originally done to now, it's still so relevant, you know, as you were mentioning. I mean, it's relevant. It's told from different perspectives where you really get a good, well-rounded point of view. And the music is great, too. Yeah, so I love the score. You've, you've got to love the music. And, um, well, it's in the title. <laughs> I hope you like ragtime. Um, but, um, yes, they the, these characters... Um, it's set in the early, early 20th century, I think around 1910, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And that was a really fascinating time in America. Um, what was happening with immigrants, populations, and the changes in American culture at the turn of the last century, 111 years ago or so, um, it's really interesting to look at it from our perspective now and see how much things have changed and how little things have changed. Um, and to understand these American stories and to know that there were so many of them and all their descendants are our friends and neighbors living in America now. It's really quite a beautiful thing. And I think it's a show that people will be just delighted by the music and completely drawn into these characters. Talk a little bit, if you can, about the acting and the actors that you have as part of your troupe. They're magnificent. We get wonderful, classically trained professional actors from all over the country. And we even have a partnership with the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London, which trains uh, some of the best actors in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so our actors come from all over. A lot are from New York or from some of the California, but... We have them from cities all over the United States. And um, many are members of Actors' Equity Association, which is the professional union of actors and stage managers. And um, many are not. We also have non-equity actors who might be in the equity membership candidacy program to become members of Actors' Equity. But they all have one thing in common, which is incredible talent. Um, uh, as I mentioned, Brian Vaughn's our artistic director, and he spends months and months and months casting the plays um, and auditioning actors and talking and collaborating with them for, for really most of the year. And it all culminates in casting them in multiple plays because we are a rep company. So you're going to play the, you know, a lead role in this musical, and then you're going to be part of the chorus and in, in this Shakespeare play. Um, so it's a great place for actors to work. A lot of them really enjoy it because they get to do rep and there aren't many repertory theater companies around where you're doing one play in the afternoon and a different play in the evening and then get a different play the next day. So it's really fun, challenging, exciting work for the actors and that helps us attract some of the best um, artists in the country. 
And again, you can see the schedule of plays and book your tickets by going to the website, which is bard.org. When we come back, other things to do before and after the festival. And welcome back to our look at the 2021 Utah Shakespeare Festival. You know, you can make the festival part of a bigger vacation. That's right. Southern Utah is incredible with mountain views, national parks, and those are both a treat not to be missed. And Frank touched on that too. Now, you, for someone who's coming there, and this is what I used to do, I'd go up there for like three days and you can literally see six in a row. Yeah. So you could see yeah. one in an afternoon, one in the evening, one in the next day in the afternoon and, and evening. And, and is that something that you guys have planned? And if so, can I just go to the website, which is bard.org, and set that up? Yes. Um, that's Fred's whole plan. Fred, Fred knew that, you know, Cedar City is not exactly on the way to someplace <laughs> big, right? It's in southern Utah. It's out of the way. So the whole idea was that people would come here. I mean, Fred had people binge watching before he, that term was even invented. <laughs> um, so that's, that's sort of, that's the best part about it is you can come here for stay three nights, see six plays, each one more fun than the next. And we also have our seminar series where we talk about the plays. We have uh, scholars who lead a discussion in our seminar grove. Um, we start at nine in the morning and we'll have, 150 people who just show up that morning and have a cup of coffee and sit outside in beautiful Cedar City, Utah. The, the weather is marvelous. And everybody sits and uh, they'll be part of a discussion about the play that they saw yesterday afternoon and yesterday night. And then they have lunch and see two more plays that day. And it's just a joy. So we're a theater company and theater's a little like baseball. Not everybody's going to like every single play we do. Not every baseball team that is going to win every single game, but that doesn't mean you don't like going to the games. But when it comes to going to Zion National Park, I've never met anybody who came out of, the, of Zion National Park and said, oh, those mountains could have been a little higher. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. And you're just going to love it. It's, you're, the hiking is world-class. Um, the scenery is just absolutely breathtaking. And you're going to like almost every play you see here, maybe every single play you see here, but you'll, you'll appreciate everything because they're all done at a very high professional level. Well, right. we endorse sure. you uh, wholeheartedly, and uh, we wish you the best for the season. Hopefully we're going to get out there as well. And, uh, just thank you so much for taking the time and explaining it and uh, kind of bringing in the, the, the soul and the heart of, of Fred Adams so that we could, uh, we could enjoy it. Please come. Please let me know when you're coming so I can welcome you. Um, and it will be the first season back after COVID. It will be the first season without Fred. Um, but it will be a great experience, I believe. And we'll, we're doing everything we can to make it great. Yeah, we would love that. Thank you so much, Frank. It's really been truly lovely. And we look forward to meeting you in person too one day. Likewise. I can't wait to see you here. Thanks. And again, special thanks to Frank for giving us the time. We hope to get there this year. Now, if you are planning a trip to the 2021 Utah Shakespeare Festival, first go to their website, bard.org, and book the plays you want to see. And again, you can book six of them and see them in a three-day period, which we highly recommend, especially if you're theater nuts like we are. <laughs> now next, book your flights. You can fly into Las Vegas, which is about a two and a half hour drive. And you can fly into Salt Lake City, which will be a three and a half hour ride. Plus, there is a small airport nearby in Cedar City that will require though some extra flights. Again, we think it's all worth it and check out our earlier segment that we did on the Shakespeare's Festival on our YouTube channel. We tour the festival, but we also give you ideas of things to do and restaurants to hit. We even found a golf course that is tucked into the beautiful mountains of Cedar City. 
All right, now before we sign off here, let's talk about a couple of things that hit us, especially while talking to Frank. And the first thing for me is, and I know you feel the same way too, the loss of Fred. It's, it is definitely gonna be very, very sad to be at this tribute. Um, and one of the things I remember is there was a statue of Fred and I would always bring it up to him because it made him mockingly angry. He said it made his ass look too big. And what was hysterical <laughs> is that that's the way Fred was. Fred had a great sense of humor. He made fun of himself and he was just a lot of fun to be around. And I, I still think the life of the, um, of the full festival is going to be there, even though Fred's not with us. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, just the time that I had with him, I could tell, I mean, not only is he brilliant, but I was going to also say he's very humble as well. Uh, you bringing up the statue is, is actually, you know, self-deprecating humor that he has. <laughs> and, you know, I love that. And his wit combined with his sweetness, I think were such a beautiful combination. You can't think of anything else except, you know, get going to the plays and go see some Shakespeare and some of the other great plays that are there. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely not much ado about nothing. I can say that. <laughs> and I just thought of that too. <laughs> and, and I'm trying to think of all the Shakespearean things we could come up with. And that we, that was the first one we actually did. So, and, <laughs> exactly. And, and I just did actually think of it right now. So that's, what's really funny. Got to be in the moment for it. So if you do get a chance to go, let us know either on our Facebook page or on our Twitter page, let us know, show us some shots that you got there. We'd love to see it. And hopefully we're going to get there and, uh, Hopefully we'll, we'll be back there a lot more time. So, um, so anyway, Absolutely. Susan, this is, this is kind of bittersweet, wasn't it? In, in yeah, it really was. It really was. And I just want to do a toast to Fred and his amazingness and wonderfulness. And I wish all of you and everybody could have met him because he's truly, truly such a special, special, unique, amazing human being. No, absolutely. So here's to you, Fred. Thank you so much. Cheers. Yeah. And here's to all you. Thanks for joining us. Again, the website is bard.org. Go check it out. Go check it out, I should say. And keep watching us here on Undercover Jet Setter. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Bye.